Okay, so today we're looking at um, the issue of sexual violence, which is of course a complicated and sensitive topic. Um, and I also encourage you to, to think about if um, this topic is perhaps maybe one that is confronting for you personally. Um, it, it might be better um, rather not to explore these materials and to focus on something else. And we can always make um, arrangements for you to do an alternative um, focus um, for this work. Um, but it's a really important topic um, for a number of reasons. Um, and it's also a topic where recently a lot of work has been done and it's something we understand in ways that um, we didn't until relatively recently. Um, and something to think about, for instance, um, you know, in the last uh, few years, we've seen the sudden emergence of the Me Too movement. We've seen um, the sudden emergence of historical cases of sexual violence and, and really old cases. I mean, with cases going back 50 years, like people are suddenly talking about things that happened to them in the 1970s, in the 1980s, in the 1990s. People are coming forward with stories. So what's that about? Why, why now? Why, why me too only, you know, in the... In, in, to you know, um, nearly 20 years into the 21st century. Why, why these historical cases now? What's changing? And it's, I think this is really important for us to look at. Um, and in one sense, these changes have been happening for a long time. They've been slow and steady. Some of them started happening in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and some of them have really increased um, very recently, only in the last three or four years. Um, but it does speak to something really interesting. It speaks to the way in which we live in a, in, in a context of changing ideas of gender and changing ideas of sexual violence. Uh, and I think that there, there, there's a really important clue there in terms of our analysis. So what do we know about sexual violence? There's a couple of key things. Firstly, that it's extremely widespread. Um, and this is a, even a relatively new idea. It was believed, um, certainly up until um, the, the you know feminists started really documenting and, and exploring um, the question of sexual violence. It was believed that sexual violence was relatively uncommon, um, and it was often believed by victims that they were they were unique and isolated victims of a crime that wasn't happening to anyone else. Um, so we know that it's very widespread. We know that as, as such, it's a massive social problem. Um, we also know something else interesting about it. One of the reasons it wasn't known how widespread it was for a long time is that it's, it's an extremely underreported crime. That, and this is one of the really striking things from a kind of a criminal justice standpoint, but also from a social analysis standpoint. The fact that that sexual violence tends not to be officially brought to the attention of the authorities, um, but also many, many survivors don't tell anyone. It's not just that they don't open sort of criminal cases, um, they, they, they often. Um, feel very, very reluctant to reveal their experiences to anyone. Um, and we need to think about why that is, because, of, because there's a link between how widespread the problem is and why it is so difficult to report it. And the third feature of sexual violence, and this is why, of course, it's a confronting topic, is that it, it seems to be a, a, a particularly emotionally distressing form of violence. All forms of violence are are, are emotionally distressing. You know, any any brutality um, is 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 traumatic. It's traumatic to be a victim of. It's traumatic to witness. Um, but there's something about sexual violence, um, and perhaps we need to think about the, the 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 way in which sexuality is a very very particular kind of experience. It's that 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 um, sexuality is ordinarily um, a kind of a way of of, of people experiencing uh, intimacy, um, pleasure, um, caring for each other, and for, for precisely that space to become something which becomes a space of, of exploitation, violence, brutality, um, um, is, 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 is very, very emotionally confronting. So we need to think about all of these. 
And when we start looking at that, we, we realize a number of things. Um, firstly, the, the ideas of sexual violence are very influenced by cultural norms and taboos. Um, and they link to the way in which societies think about sexuality in general. And so thinking about sexual, uh, sexual violence has, has tended to be structured by the way in which societies have taboos against um, talking about sexuality in general and particularly religious taboos. There are these kind of long historical traditions of, of um, regarding sexuality as an impolite topic, as a, an unacceptable topic. Um, so, so open talk about sexuality um, has tended to be um, viewed negatively um, within conservative societies. Um, and we see this, for instance, we see this in fights around um, uh, it's sexuality education in schools and, and conservative groups opposing uh, um, young people finding out that, you know, the sort of basic sort of life knowledge that they need um, uh, to engage in, 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 in kind of consensual and safe um, sexual practices. And we saw that recently um, in the attacks on um, the Safe Schools program. Um, and we see it in um, the, the extent to which something like um, marriage equality was only very, very recently legally established um, and that there was a lot of opposition to it, that many um, conservative and religious groups actually didn't want um, marriage equality to be a, a, a basic legal right. Um, so, so sexual violence is really inseparable from the way in which cultures and societies think about sexuality. And it's also particularly influenced by a whole lot of kind of myths and beliefs about, um, about what kind of sexual violence occurs, about why it occurs, how it occurs. And interestingly, um, this is a really good example of, of Gilligan's um, idea that, that people have ideas about violence. They just don't know that they have those ideas. They just don't think critic. They can't be consciously aware of them, so they don't know. But people particularly have ideas about sexual violence, um, and those ideas, turns out, can be extremely damaging. So, let's look at one of the the, the sort of areas of ideas. Well, people have theories about what causes sexual violence, like why do men rape? Okay, and in this lecture, I'm going to talk as if we're talking about men as rapists and women as victims. But of course, we know that that's highly inaccurate. We know that not all rapists are men. Um, and we know that many victims are not women. Um, that sexual violence against men is a reality, particularly sexual violence against boys and younger men. Um, and this is a real issue because if it has, has taken a long time for sexual violence against women to get recognized, it's taking even longer for sexual violence against men to be taken seriously. And the, people are still struggling um, to have um, the sexual violence against men properly recognized, properly responded to. There's a real lack of social recognition. Um, there's real difficulties. If, it, if it's difficult for a woman to go and report a sexual assault, it's doubly difficult for a man to report a sexual assault. Um, so, so this is a really complicated situation. And this idea of like, why do men rape even is, this is, a, this is already a, a, a um, an incorrect assumption because people of all genders rape. However, there is a very, very clear statistical predominance of men as, as perpetrators of sexual violence and as perpetrators of sexual violence against other men and against women. Um, and there's much more of a prevalence of men as offenders than there are of women as victims. Um, but um, just to be aware that we're already bringing in this conceptual baggage when we even ask a question like, like why do men rape? Um, okay, and there, 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 there has been a, a historical kind of idea that has been thrown around. And, it, and it's a classic example of this kind of sociobiological, these sort of um, pop evolutionary explanations. 
um, which is that, um, well, men evolved an, uh, a sexual drive um, because for the perpetuation of the species, what men need to do is to impregnate as many females as possible to create as many offspring as possible. And so, so, the, so the, in order to, for the, the genes to, you know, exist in the gene pool, um, the um that that men men had evolved with this kind of sex drive um uh, and women didn't need to evolve a sex drive and there's an interesting kind of erasure of female sexuality there but but the interesting thing that not only is that kind of that that sort of um pop uh, uh sociobiology kind of theory sort of widely believed by people who haven't studied um, gender violence. Um, it, it's something else that's really interesting that gets added to that, is that this, that this sexual drive is kind of uncontrollable. You know, that, 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 that other kind of drives, you know, other kind of impulses people have um, are, are assumed to be um, easily manageable. Um, and so people don't, you know, um, um, there, there, there's no kind of equivalent of, oh, like the reason people steal stuff or, you know, they steal f um, is because they have a drive to possess kind of certain things. Um, um, but but th the particular way in which it gets articulated is interesting, is this idea that, 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 that um, this, this drive is out of control and, and that, um, and what that leads to doing is is not simply the idea that well that men need to strive to control this this um, uh, um, acclaimed sexual drive, but actually women need to take responsibility for controlling it too. Um, and it leads to this idea that women should 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 um, take constant steps to assure that the sexual drive is not triggered in men. So they should you know, behave in certain ways, dress in certain ways. Um, but the trouble with this, you know, this evolutionary sex drive theory is it just doesn't fit at all with the facts. It, it simply does not account for the, the, the context and ways in which sexual assaults occur. Um, you know, um, uh, and that, that, that the patterns are distinct. I mean, the places in which, you know, there are a lot of, um, uh, perhaps what might be perceived as sort of, you know, sexually enticing woman, perhaps a beach on a summer's day. That's not where rapes are happening. Um, it, 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 you know, there's just no correlation between how this uh, purported sex drive would be supposed to be being played out um, and, 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 and how, it, how, it in, how sexual assault in fact happens in a way that is, is, is predatory on vulnerabilities rather than sexual desire. Um, so that theory is, a, is a, an analysis, a particularly weak one, despite its popularity. Then there's, a, there, there's another theory, and this theory was to some extent informed by early feminism. Um, which is the idea that well, well, and that that rape is not really a crime of sexual desire. Rape is about the assertion of power, and it's about the dominance. It's about it's about forcing someone to do something, um, not about achieving sexual pleasure. And that's and that's where the motivation for rape. So rape is really. In, in that account, an act of dominance rather than an act of, 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 of sexuality. And, and sometimes the, the same kind of thing gets slipped into there is that men are, have a kind of intrinsic desire for dominance. This is the nature of men to, to want to be dominant. Um, and, but, but on closer scrutiny, that, it seems hard to sustain that view that certainly um, male aggression, male dominance is of, clearly observable features within a kind of patriarchal society. But the question that needs to be asked is, is this this kind of some kind of innate drive to, to exert power that exists in men? Or is this something that is dependent on culture and society? And once again, as soon as we start looking, we start noticing as we did with the biological sex drive theory, that there's huge variability, firstly between individuals, but secondly between cultures and societies. Uh, in, in the, the ways and extent to which men do strive for um, uh, um, dominance, 
Um, and so the, so the idea that either a sexual drive or a sort of desire for power and dominance are, are somehow universal and innate, um, both of these really fail when we analyze the actual patterns um, and uh, uh, linked to the occurrence of, um, of, of sexual violence. So if those two theories aren't particularly helpful at this point, well, what, what are we left with? And one of the more helpful theories that it's worth paying attention to is um, the more recent work around the idea of rape culture. Um, and this is an important concept because it, because it addresses a particular problem. Within popular culture, the idea of the rapist, okay, the, 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 the rapist as a kind of a particularly sick, terrible, depraved individual um, that um, is, is, is a really powerful idea. And, and what's, when we look at this idea, what's important in it is it individualizes um, the, 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 the act of sexual violence. It's, it locates it within the, the pathology, within the, the mental illness um, of the rapist or, or their social deviance. So, so that rapists are these kind of psychopaths. They, they, you know, they, um, they are, they, they kind of exist as, 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 as different from other people. Um, and that's the important thing that in, in that construction of the, of the rapist as this kind of worst case criminal, it's the deviance of the rapist that is, uh, that is emphasized and that they not like normal people. Um, and, and, and that's a very powerful idea. Um, but it also is an idea that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Um, firstly, because too many people are involved with different kinds of sexual violence for it to be seen as, 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 as being unique and extremely deviant in that way. Um, and when we start looking at it and looking at the patterns in which it follows, it becomes much clearer that this is not just a matter of that there's certain aberrant individuals, but rather that there are individuals who are expressing a kind of ex in an extreme way elements of the existing gender system around them. Um, and the thing that perhaps makes them different is simply the degree to which they are expressing a whole lot of things that are already normalized within the societies in which they find themselves. Um, and when we started looking at, start looking at it that way, it becomes clear that certain aspects of, of culture and society make sexual violence more likely, just like certain aspects of culture and society make all violence more likely. Like, you know, we looked at why, why is gun violence more likely in the USA than in Canada? Why is it more common in the USA than in, in, in Australia? And, and, you know, when we're looking at those things, um, we already started noticing, you know, there's, there's things behind. It's not just that they're more crazy people who want to shoot people up. Similarly, with sexual violence, that it, that it, that it plays out differently in different social contexts, and it, and it plays out differently because it, it, it is shaped by those social contexts. So what are the social and cultural factors that we, that we start identifying as being linked to higher levels of sexual violence? Well, firstly, male dominance. The extent to which male dominance is, 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 is normalized and not just normalized, but kind of required. Remember when we were talking about that school bullying, how, how the boys were kind of forced into, into male dominance um, um, and, and the extent to which that is a, a, a that, that, that in order to be accepted and to have your identity recognized, um, and viewed positively as uh, uh, um, in a male masculine role, you you have to perform these kinds of acts of dominance, um, and that they also link to acts of of entitlement. And dominance and entitlement are not the same thing, but but they are linked. And entitlement refers to the the idea that as a as a man, you have a right to certain things, like you have a right to respect whatever that word is taken to mean you have a right to to um 
be treated in certain ways. You have, um, you have, you have a right to expect to be obeyed. You have the right to expect um, certain people to be submissive towards you. Um, and, and, and that's the kind of um, realm of, of entitlement. And of course, that then links to sexual entitlement, that you have a right to, you know, that if you've bought someone dinner, you have a right to expect them to have sex with you. Or if someone has invited you into their home, you have a right to expect them. These are, these are all kinds of, sort of cultural notions of entitlement that interestingly tend to get attached to, to, to masculinity rather than um, uh, femininity or any other gender categories. The other factor that it's linked to is the extent to which there is sort of male institutional power and sort of networks of male power. That, and so you see in, in um, the way this works, for instance, in, in many societies, the police tend to be male, the, the magistrates and judges tend to be male, the, um, the, 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 the politicians who write the laws tend to be male. Um, and so, so you, you get this kind of convergence of gender interests um, and also um, convergence of, of, of kind of collaboration. Like we saw a, a terrible c case recently in which a police, a male police officer um, released information uh, it, um, to his sort of male buddy about, about his, um, his, his friend's partner who, who, um, who was in a place of safety because this, because this, this officer's friend um, was a was a, a, a an offender he was violent towards his intimate partner and that's just an example of kind of men you know sort of you know backing each other up collaborating with each other up in the same way we saw with those us cops sort of covering up acts of violence we see we see this sort of like um turning away from minimizing trivializing um acts of gender violence um between men because they 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 populate those networks where those that that have the power to do those those policing and and um, and justice networks. Um, the other thing linked to to this is, is is sort of cultural assumptions about differences in trustworthiness, and this is a really interesting thing which we might not notice. But but the but but one of the kind of terrible historical legacies has been. This idea that, um, and it's still built, it was built into Western legal systems and is still built into some other legal system, that women shouldn't be believed. Um, that if there's a testimony between a woman and a man, the, the man is more likely to be truthful than the woman. Um, and this makes um, uh, the reporting of, of, of sexual violence against women very, very difficult. Um, but it's not just that. When we, we talked about the sort of masculine dominance and entitlement, but linked to that, and this is incredibly important. I, I don't think this can, the, the interaction between these two elements can be stressed enough. Linked to that is, the, is its kind of opposite, which is feminine submissiveness and acquiescence. Um, that women are, t are, are, that within the sort of traditional feminine gender role, femininity is pr precisely in being, um, uh, um, obliging, um, submissive, uh, attempting to make other people happy, attempting to do what, what, what other people require. And so you've got this terrible kind of system of, of this masculine assertion, dominance, and, and feminine submissiveness and ac ac acquiescence. And so, of course, that's going to play out in the realm of sexuality that in, in, in these kind of moments of sexuality, that that, that, that dominance is going to be, is, 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 is going to be, be a factor that is expressed um, in, in men with that sort of traditional masculinity and the female submissiveness, the, the idea that one, one has to, that, you, that you, you can't fight back, you can't say no. Um, and this is um, particularly interesting not just and and it's and and it's it's one of the reasons why certain kinds of sexual assault uh, have 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 been harder to report and take and uh, have taken longer to be recognized because the idea of a sexual assault by a stranger where you know a, an ideal victim is simply going along you know doing her shopping whatever 
uh, and then is, is, is suddenly violently assaulted by a complete stranger. Um, that's easily recognized because of the kind of illegitimacy of it. But the other kinds of sexual assault that rely on the fact that people know each other, that this person, oh, been on a few dates with this person, or this person has been buying you a few drinks, and suddenly it's not a brute force between strangers, but the, but the exploitation of these conventions around masculine dominance and, and feminine submissiveness that come into play. And so these kind of much more common um, experiences of kind of acquaintance rape, date rape, um, are much more complicated and much more common. Um, and because they're so embedded in traditional gender roles, it also becomes much harder to, for people to identify that in fact a, a crime has been committed, um, that, that in fact um, this should not have taken place, that, that, that there was that, that, um, that sort of, you know, an indication of reluctance should have been taken seriously. There shouldn't have been a demand for submissiveness. Um, and, 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 and these are the kind of areas of sexual violence that have taken much longer to recognize and understand it. And, and we're only now starting to find ways of, of, of dealing with them effectively. And of course, the other factor that we referred to before is the question around um, the, the way in which a culture thinks about sexuality and the taboos and silence and shame, particularly around feminine sexuality. Um, and, and in a way that they often isn't around masculine sexuality. So, so for, for um, women who are victims of sexual violence, the, um, the, um, they, 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 they face these additional sexual taboos of like well, what, that, that the, the mere fact of them being involved with a sexual scenario is, 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 is immediately sort of um, within certain cultural formations um, constructed as a, as a cause of shame. And similarly for male victims of sexual violence, the fact that they were, that they were sexu um, sexually violated by a man uh, or, or, or by a woman. Um, in the case of, of male perpetrators, um, there's the shame around uh, that is constructed in terms of homophobia, in terms of of like, well, this is that 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 their sense of 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 masculinity is linked to a sense of heterosexuality, and suddenly, and being sexually assaulted by. Um, by a man makes them feel a kind of homophobic shame. And uh, similarly, men who are sexually assaulted by women feel the kind of shame of, of their, their masculine kind of dominance um, being totally undermined by that. The, the, the idea that, they, that their autonomy was taken away by someone who they, their culture expects them to, to exert dominance over. So all of these factors, all of these, these different kind of cultural elements that exist in different ways in different societies and exist in different ways and at different historical moments. All of these sort of lock together uh, in particular ways. They intersect in very specific ways in different times and places to form uh, rape culture, to form the cultural backdrop in which um, sexual violence becomes becomes more common, becomes easier to, to commit, and becomes easier to get away with. Um, and it becomes less recognized um, in terms of its seriousness, in terms of its harmfulness, in terms of its brutality. Um, and it becomes more difficult to hold um, perpetrators accountable and for survivors to seek support. Um, so it's really important the way in which the, the, the idea of, of rape culture really gives us a a framework that helps us understand the social context in which um, sexual violence happens and enables us to identify the specific um, features of it. Okay, so I'm going to um, end this first video now um, and then we will go on in a second video to look at the the rest of the material on rape culture that we went on sexual violence that we want to cover today.